can have uh, early in the day of uh, Dr. Jose Antonio Cohen, president of Goucher College. Uh, he has started his career at Stanford University, was director of their jazz ensemble. He was the founding director of the Center for uh, History and Analysis of Recorded Music at the University of Southampton. Uh, and he was the first endowed chair of the K. Stecker uh, Music Center at Georgetown University. He was Dean of the Fine Arts School at Miami University, uh, became Dean of the Metal School of the Arts at SMU in Dallas, and uh, he is currently uh, the President of uh, Goucher College and the author of Teaching Naked, uh, and Don't Get the Wrong Idea, it's about the use of technology in the classroom. Uh, he has also uh, been uh, featured recently in the Times and the Chronicle of Higher Education for his uh, innovative and, and path-breaking approach on rethinking of the admissions process. Uh, and I think that conversation is continuing, but it has certainly gotten, gone national at this point. So uh, let's give a warm welcome, a uh, warm CUNY welcome to Jose Antonio Bowen. Good afternoon, how are you? All right, so you can sit closer, you're coming in, I, I don't spit too much. Uh, so if this stuff on the screen makes sense and you want to live tweet, that's fine. If you don't know what any of this stuff on the screen means, you need to find an eight-year-old pronto and get some help. Um, because your students are going to wonder if you have three heads. Um, so I'm going to try to convince you this afternoon that some of this stuff matters, well, it matters to your students, you know that, but my, I'm, my job is to really convince you that it should matter to you too, and that there's actually teaching that can happen um, through the use of this. Relationships, right? Relationships between faculty and, and students. They are they ever say credits, courses, semesters change my life. It's not how it works. So the the other structures we inherited most of them. What really matters is the interaction between faculty and students. So my job is to try to figure out how can we maximize it. How can we leverage all of this other stuff so that the time that we spend in the classroom really is focused on that. The second key idea, though, is that technology, while it's here to stay, is only a tool. It's not a strategy. And I know I go to lots of say, oh, we have, a, we have a technology strategy. We're going to increase the amount of technology. I say, you know, chalk is a technology. <laughs> if we increase the amount of chalk, what do we have? More chalk. <laughs> right? Our strategy is, of course, more student learning. Now, in order to have more student learning, it might be helpful to have some chalk. But the point is that technology is a tool, and so we really need to figure out when, where, how, and why to use it. But let's not forget the real goal, which is increasing student learning. And finally, I want you to think about what we really do for a living. Our real value, despite our titles, is as Your real value to students is not how much you know, it's who you are. And who you are as an intellectual role model and how you can design systems, right? Pedagogy is largely a design problem. It's not about how much you know, it's about how much you can help students change. Because think about it. If you memorize lots of stuff, if you know lots of stuff, that's fine. But what we really need is the ability to say, you know, I've learned this new thing. And that makes me rethink all of the things that I already know. Right? I need to change the whole system. It's the connectedness amongst all the things that we know that's really the issue. And as we know from watching our recent presidential election, change is hard. And it's actually something that's kind of 
you know, forbidden in our political sphere, right? You know, don't be a flip-flopper. But smart people are smart because they know how to change their minds. Learning is only real learning if it changes the other stuff that you already know. So that's really the design problem that we're trying to address. And what's interesting about this is that technology has actually made this more important because our relationship with knowledge has changed and we've become fundamentally confused about this. So when I went to college, and I wanted to know something. I had to go to this funky place called the library, which had these funky things called books and the encyclopedia. Remember that? But think about the encyclopedia. The encyclopedia was relatively error-free. It, it, it had mistakes, but it was mostly trying to give you facts. It was fairly reliable. It had no cat videos in it. Right? There were no jokes. There was no satire in the encyclopedia. Right? So now let's compare that situation that was relatively where knowledge was scarce, but fairly reliable, with today's situation for college students, where knowledge is abundant, knowledge is rich, knowledge is everywhere, it's easy to find, but it comes in the mixture of all of this other garbage. Right? So the internet is a great resource. There really is unbelievable amounts of, of material and content. You can learn all sorts of new things. But you've now got to be able to figure out what's, the, what's reality, what's truth, what's hyperbole, right? So we've become fundamentally confused about this, right? In fact, we're so confused, we actually call the thing in our pocket a smartphone. <laughs> As if it were really smart. But think about Siri, right? Siri knows more than you. It's true, right? The internet has access to more content than in any college classroom, in any library, in any of our, in any of your heads. But she's dumb, right? Because she doesn't know the difference between fact and fiction, or between truth and hyperbole. Again, think about the recent presidential right stuff, right? I mean, it, the, this ability to discern, to to think critically, has actually gone up in value as the value of knowing more than other people has gone down, right? Because again, yeah, I mean, it's good, you gotta know something. But what you really need to be able to do is to how to find new things. How do you learn new things, right? Called the new learning economy, right? The information age is over. It's not just about how much you know, it's about how much you can learn. But how much you can learn means how much you can change your mind. How much you can integrate the various pieces of things that you've learned into, into real knowledge, into real wisdom, right? Not just have lots of factoids that you reel off. Right? But our democracy requires, and learning requires, the ability for students to be able to weed through all of the cat videos and all the Facebook and all that other stuff, to be able to figure out what might have some truth value. And you're thinking, okay, how hard is that? So, are you mad? My students posted this on our Facebook page for a course. Are you mad? Y'all are probably mad here. I mean, you might be mad, but... You shouldn't be mad because this is, is true, because it's not true. This is satire, right? So the source here is important, where the student found this information. This is not from the New York Times, right? So, so students are fundamentally confused, right? Because again, think about the bar to being an encyclopedia. You could be wrong, but at least you had to go through some editorial process, et cetera. Now any idiot can post something on Facebook. And that's, in fact, the most common source of readership for the New York Times. Right? It's not home delivery, obviously, but it's not even the New York Times website. Most people don't go to the New York, web, New York Times website looking to read the paper, or even their iPad. The, the most the common way people get New York Times stories is through Facebook, because somebody else read it. Right? So again, think about the filtering that goes on there. So students get confused, the internet is full of this stuff, and you think, yes, but faculty surely wouldn't fall for this. Oh, yes, you would. Sorry, so this got posted and circulated. This, of course, is a satire on the Michigan football coach who actually did get paid $52 million, right? Um, would it have been a Slavic languages professor? Um, so let me introduce you to the police chief in Annapolis, Maryland, my home state. He put his hand on a Bible, and he swore to the state legislator that 37 people were killed on the first day of legalization of marijuana. He swore this testimony, his hand on a Bible. His only problem was his source. The Daily Current, 
that how we spell current? I think maybe that's the wrong sort of current. But, and amazingly, he kept his job, right? So, this, and of course, but surely we think you could trust CNN or the BBC, right? This is, this is, these are news sites. Wrong. Both of these stories are from people at home just like you. These are called user-generated content. Right? So, so one of you was having it on one day and posted this, and CNN thought, hey, giant asteroid, sure. And they posted it for the rest of the world as CNN News. Right? So, so the world has now given our students more access to information than ever before, but at the same time made that information less accurate and, and full of all sorts of other kinds of things. So think about textbooks. When you get a job, do they give you a textbook? They give you an encyclopedia that says, here is all the information. They say, look it up on the internet, right? So when we give students textbooks, I sometimes wonder if we're not making things too, too easy, too simple, and, and less messy than they should be, because the world is actually messy, and, the, and the, the learning and the knowledge acquisition is really messy. And so perhaps we should just let them look for stuff on the internet, and then help them make better choices about what stuff they think is reliable. And I'll come back and, and talk about that. So that's the first point, that our relationship to knowledge has fundamentally changed. And so what we, how we teach and how we interact with students and how they, what they're going to do is going to be different. The second point I'd like to make today is that social proximity has also really changed the human condition. Right? The meaning of friends is totally different. When I, when I went to college, I was given a bag of dimes and told to call home on Sunday. Right? And there's a pay phone at the end of the hall. If you don't know what a pay phone is, just ask somebody <laughs> younger. Right? And we'd line up on Sunday, we'd put our dimes, and you, you know what a dime is, we still have those, okay? You put your dime in the pay phone, you call home, and so of course one Sunday, I forgot. So what did I do? And I forgot to call mom on Sunday, what did I do? On Monday, what did I do? I didn't call on Monday, I'm not, I'm not even sure the phone works on Monday. <laughs> and besides, mom would not be sitting by the phone at home on Monday. And on Sunday, she's sitting by the phone waiting for me to call, right? So I waited a week, and I called the following Sunday. Hi, Mom, it's your son. A son? I have a son? <laughs> if I had a son, he would call every Sunday, right? Yeah, okay, I'm sorry, Mom, right? But, so contrast it with the current student who texts their parents six times a day, right? I mean, they're still in contact, right? So, so this is radically changed, and if, and if you don't, think that this really means a difference in the human condition, then find yourself an 18-year-old and ask them about dating. <laughs> Remember dating? All right, so true story. My, my daughter calls me from a bar when she's 21. Actually, I'm sorry, she texts me. I'm just, in my imagination, I was using the phone device. <laughs> but I was actually not talking to her, I was getting a text from her, right? And of course, she says, <clears throat> it starts with, Dad, I'm at this bar with my roommate, and we're thinking about going out with these guys. And I'm thinking, wait, I know that this is like the, hi doctor, I have a, I have a friend who has a rash. It's like, it's like I know what she's thinking, right? She's fine, your, your friend wants to go here, okay. So, you know, and I'm thinking, well, how do I respond to this? And she says, and it's okay, Dad, don't worry, they don't have any STDs. <laughs> it's the first thing you know about them. So, right, and I said, how, how, how do you know this as well? I've checked on Hula, the site that helps you get laid. <laughs> Actually, I'm sorry, it's, it's changed its name. The, the good people of Hawaii have objected to this. <laughs> and so they're now called Health Fauna. Health Fauna, what the heck does that mean? It means it's health because you can re release your health records, your medical records. Literally, look at the screen here, right? You can't see it in the back, I'll tell you what it says. It's a picture of a beautiful young woman, and it says, HIV, gonorrhea, chlamydia, except, right? And, it, and so, so if, rather than having to ask those embarrassing questions, hi, I'd like to sleep with you. Do you have gonorrhea? <laughs> you can, in fact, simply go to this app, and the person who wants to have sex with you is released, though you don't have to ask that embarrassing question. So if she says to me, don't worry, Dad, they don't have STDs, I'm not really relieved at this point. And then I'm thinking, by the way, right? Because right, this is the this is the this is the text every parent wants to get on a Saturday night, right? Great, fantastic. 
Um, so as I'm thinking about this, she, she sends me another text and says, and even better, Dad, they get great reviews on Lulu. <laughs> Lulu is an app for girls. You know about Yelp? Right? When you go to a restaurant, you go to Yelp, and you say, did anybody else like this restaurant? They say, yeah. They're... This is Yelp for boys. And what's interesting about Lulu is that it uses Facebook data from your college. So it's really designed for within the college environment. So whatever cooney.edu, whatever the address is for all those kids on Facebook, every boy without their permission has been sucked into Lulu. And so there's a picture, their Facebook picture and their little profile picture is here in Lulu. And the girls can rate them. Aren't you glad you're not dating, hopefully, right now? <laughs> Right, so they have in college. So if you notice, it says, you know, this says, look, the, um, you know, a rap for, for, for girls, um, make better decisions. This doesn't make any sense to me, right? So, so I'm, I'm thinking, okay, what do I say? I'm gonna be the nice, you know, 21st century dad, and so I say, so, honey, what do they like, these boys you've met? And I get the, dad! Even in text, you know it sounds like that. We haven't met them yet. We're only talking on Tinder. Tinder is a GPS app. There's, there's a couple of others. Apparently in New York, Bumble is now bigger than Tinder. Um, or you can do Coffee Meets Bagel. Plenty of fish, right? I mean, think about this. There's a whole like party game here. Let's think of names for dating apps, right? Um, so <laughs> GPS tells me that the boys are in the bar at the other end of the bar. They're in the room with me. I can see they want a date. So they're talking by chat through this app. And of course, being the 20th century parent I am, I said, honey, remember that talk in the second grade? Those boys are strangers. <laughs> Those are strangers. You don't go home with one of them. You haven't even met them yet. And I get this text back. It says, Dad, it's safer this way. <laughs> yeah, those of you who are parents, be terrified. So let's talk now about office hours. <laughs> really? You think these kids are going to come to your office? So remember, first of all, right, it's safer if they meet you online first. Right? I mean, and actually, my daughter says this, she says this to me, look, Dad, name me a person who's going to be important in my life who I'm going to meet face to face without having first seen them on the internet. Like, you're the one who told me before you go to a job interview, always do your homework. I Google everybody before I go to a job interview, before I go see a client. You think I'm going to go meet my in-laws without first checking, checking them out online? Romantic partners? Oh, I'm not going to go with some stranger. I'm going to make sure they're okay online, right? So that, that mentality of looking for what you, what you, who you do exist out there. Do you have a life, right? And so they're going to Google you. They're going to get a sense of that. So going to your office blind without having first done this is going to seem very scary. So and remember, your office is a scary place. I mean, actually, your office is the inner circle of hell, frankly. I mean, first of all, you're there. <laughs> you were scary. You have degrees I've never even heard of. And then you have all those book things. I'm allergic to that. Right? And, and you're only there for an hour at a time. What's that about? My bank is always open. Right? Actually, it's true. I, I moved from Texas to Maryland. My bank is in Texas. And I said, do I need to change? Do I need to, do we need a bank? I said, oh, yeah, we'll have, I need a bank. And I said, no, it turns out I don't actually need a bank in Maryland. Right? I can take a picture of a check, I have to make a deposit. Right? I can do my banking online. I haven't been to my bank in years. But that's the normal these days. So, and then you want me to go visit you physically there? Could we just talk online? So we do want to have these right relationships. Remember I said fact that these relationships are what we're really after. We built the physical space, we're here, we want them to be here. So I want that to happen. But as a first step, 
right? Maybe you shouldn't be asking them to have sex on the table with you. I mean, that's what it sounds like when you say, well, you want to have office hours with me, I mean, right? It's, this, is a, this is a weird thing. And again, for us, it seems normal. And, and by the way, everything I'm going to say today is disproportionately true for first-generation students, right? People who don't know how the system works, right? So when I was, I was, I was the um, advisor for the Hispanic fraternity at SMU, and I made the mistake one year of suggesting that as part of their academic plan, maybe all of the brothers every semester would just go to one office hour with each professor. No, please, any, any, anything but that. We'll pick up trash for days. Community service project, something, right? I mean, and, and this was real fear. This was, was what have we done wrong? Right? So the, the assumption that you go to the office hours to get help, talk to your professor, build a relationship was not normal for this group of students. But if I said, hey, I'm going to be on Facebook for an hour on Tuesday night, before the problem set is due on Wednesday, before the test on Wednesday, before something is due, on the, before the reading, if you have extra questions, I'll be available for an hour on Facebook, on Google Hangout, some sort of platform on Twitter, and you can ask me questions. That's going to have a much lower barrier. You can eventually build a relationship there and get them to come into your office, but it probably starts by saying, hey, I exist out here in cyberspace. It's okay. And again, so, you know, quotes from students. I'll probably never meet my best friend in person. Right? And that sounds very strange to us. But the student then goes on to explain to me, no, no, I'm playing video games with this guy in Australia all the time. We've been friends since we were 12. I don't know if we'll ever meet, but you know, we really we talk every day. Right? That's we're not used to that. Right? That's different. I'm not sure it's bad, but it is different. So we have to recognize that their assumptions about social proximity, about human interaction, are different. And so we may have to meet them out there and then pull them in. That's a gen generally true for teaching in general, right? Good teaching starts with what matters to your students. It ends with what matters to you. It doesn't start with what matters to you. Hi, I want to teach you this. Right? It starts with what matters to your students. Um, and then people say to me, there's one little final bit of this, which is to recognize that students are attached to their phones in interesting ways. This is non-trivial. For those of us who didn't grow up with a phone attached, it's different. So people often say to me, what is the strangest thing you learn as a new college president? I say, well, we have a plumber on staff whose job it is to take phones out of toilets. <laughs> this, is a, this is a whole job. Um, this is actually a post from a student on, on Facebook about what they do um, and about how many times this happens. And, so, but the, 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 and this is actually the other information you need to know. Um, you should never borrow a student's cell phone because 30% of students cannot use the bathroom without a cell phone. <laughs> they always have a cell phone with them in the toilet. So if you want to reach them, right, it's their cell phone. But it also means if you say, put your phones away, you've actually done something that's going to create some anxiety. That's OK. I mean, I actually want them. I, one of my worst ideas as a president was to have cell phone-free dinners in the dining hall once a month. One of my worst ideas. I'm still pursuing this idea because I believe in it, but I didn't realize how stress-inducing it would be for to put your phone in the basket. Okay. Now take your hand away. You didn't tell me about that. Right? No, 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 can't do it. Right? So, um, so this is a stress intent. I used to say, you know, if you really want to have a cell phone-free classroom, Right. First of all, you have to be careful because, right, um, students can text like this. I've seen this. This is me texting. Right. Or as my daughter would say, Dad, nobody's crotch is that interesting. If you're looking at the tops of their heads, you're just texting. Right. And we actually have data on this now. Uh, my colleague at the University of Georgia um, has put people in classrooms to watch in big lecture halls, and it turns out that the people in the front of the classroom are a third less likely to be on Facebook um, or shopping. And that most people in the back 
four or five rows of your classroom that most of them are on Facebook or shopping most of the time during a big lecture class. People in the front, less likely. The bad news is the people in the front, twice as likely to fall asleep. <laughs> There's less to do. That's true, this is, this is just observable data that people have, right? So I used to say, if you want to solve this problem, you could, you could get one of those plastic shoe racks and you could have everybody put their cell phone in the shoe rack, you know, on the, on, on the door, that hangs on the door, you know, and you could, you could put your cell phone there and you could watch it the whole time. <laughs> then I decided the CIA was too fond of that technique instead of waterboarding, and I probably should not recommend that. Um, so actually, I didn't finish the story. The, the, the strangest thing I've learned as a college president is not that students drop their cell phone in the toilet all the time. The, the strangest thing is, they want it back. <laughs> Don't ever ask them to use their phone. All right. So the world has changed. Our relationship to knowledge has changed. Two, the world has changed because social proximity, that the way that we use our phones, the way we connect to other human beings, our assumptions about what it means to have a relationship, have fundamentally changed. There's a third change, though, in the world, which is equally profound, which is that we've been overtaken by customization and gaming. That all of us are now used to, remember the old days it was coffee, cream or sugar? Those were your choices. Right? There was no half-calf macchiato, cappuccino, and you know, with stuff on it, right? There was just coffee, right? And so the world has also been gamified. So, you know, you get points, you stay at this hotel, you get points, you stay at that hotel, you don't. Well, yes, you do, but there are different points, and you can't, right? I mean, and so we're all playing this game, literally, of, well, if I fly this airline, I get more points, and I get more points. This credit card gives me reward back, right? It's all, right? That's all been gamified. And this comes from video games. And the designers of video games were very clever. They did not intend to create the world's greatest learning platform. That was not, hey, let's create a learning platform today. Their intent was to sell boxes of video games and charge you lots of money and make billions of dollars. But in doing that, they recognized a fundamental truth. Nobody wants to read the manual, I mean textbook, before they do the thing. Right? They just want to, they don't want to have, they want to do the thing and then learn as they're doing. That's a lot more fun than read the textbook first and then come to class and I'll teach you something, right? So they invented a system where the game teaches itself and that if, it, if it's too hard, it gets easier. If it's too easy, it gets harder immediately. It adjusts to you. And they call this pleasantly frustrating. The zone for a good video game is to have every user simultaneously and constantly be pleasantly frustrated the entire time. Think about that. That's the environment where learning happens, right? We should have thought of that. That's where we want every student to be. Because if it's too pleasant, what do you do? You quit. If it's too frustrating, what do you do? You quit. And of course, when you quit, you stop learning, right? It's like, I'm going to take tennis lessons. That's great. No, I quit. Well, I guess you're not learning tennis anymore because you quit, right? So everything we do in learning has to, has to Manage between these two poles. It doesn't matter if it's physics or if it's yoga. Hi, welcome to yoga. This week we'll be practicing the inhale. Come back next week for the exhale. That's just too slow. I'm, I'm, right? Hi, welcome to yoga. Stand on your head, please. Push up into the handstand. Hold. We're here for a week. No, I mean, right? That's just too much. So. So we want it to be somewhere in the middle, just challenging enough, but not too challenging. Oh, and we want it individualized and customized so that everybody is being pleasantly challenged all the time. A video game can do that. You're on level one, you're on level 30, you're on level 300, simultaneously playing. Oh, it's too hard for you, you're gonna be back down to level 299 in a minute, right? It's too easy for you, you're at level 35, right? It's gonna adjust instantly. So students, by the time they get to us, have spent more hours playing video games than they have in classes, even if they had perfect attendance. 10,000 hours on average is how many hours of video games an 18-year-old has played in this country. So they are used to being pleasantly frustrated and learning stuff all the time and being totally engaged in a personalized way. Then they come to us. 
and we talk to a room full of people and they go, wait, say that again. Stop, no, go faster, I've heard that. It's not working, you're still talking. Right? That's a frustrating, that's just, that's just frustrating, there's no pleasant about that. Right? Because what do good teachers do? We teach to the middle. That's good teaching. Right? So how do we individualize, how do we deal with students who want to have this individual? So this is a problem. So part of my suggestion is we need to make college more like a good video game. That doesn't mean we have to use video games in our teaching, although it might. But it means our structures, semesters, credit hours, courses, all that stuff that actually doesn't really have any impact on learning. We might have to rethink all of that to try to engage students in a way that a video game does. Okay, so I want to show you a couple of examples. So my first suggestion is going to be that when you think about content and first exposure to students, you don't want this to happen in class. We know this, which is why we always assign a reading or something in advance. We say, do the reading, read chapter one before you come to class, and they don't. So what do we do? We summarize it for them, and they say, hey, guess what, Dad? My daughter, another true story, she says, you're going to be so proud of me. I saved you a lot of money this semester. What'd you do? I didn't buy any books. <laughs> says, well, you know, you can get a sample chapter on the iPad or on the internet. And so after the first week, I realized that nobody really meant us to do the reading, so I just stopped doing it. And that was her only semester of all A's. I think I was madder at, at us than I was at her, right? Because she realized that she, there was another way to do the learning. So the ugly truth about this is that students are good at the internet, and in fact, they're probably better at Google than we are. And so what they do when you assign a reading is not only do they not do the reading, they look for a, a short video, right? Actually, if they're, if they're, in, if they're you know, really good students, they might go to one of these places and say, oh, look, econ, not taking econ. Oh, look, there's an econ course. Um, he looks just like my teacher, except that he has a Nobel Prize. But, you know, I have lots. Look, here's the same topic he was going to talk on. And look, it doesn't take you very long to find learning. Uh, today I decided not to use PowerPoint. I'm using index cards. <laughs> this is traditional uh, lecture style. Uh, I wanted to talk today about uh, really. So first of all, look at this. You know, hour and 15 minutes. If you're doing this, they're falling asleep. But if you're doing this, there's some other guy that'll make them fall asleep faster on the internet. <laughs> Only he's at Yale and he has wood paneling. Um, <laughs> which apparently, right, I mean, think about it. Students are gonna make decisions based upon, they're, 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 well, which is the better lecture? Well, he has wood paneling, man. So, uh, on the one hand, they, they might find um, great content. So they might find um, this instead of your, uh, here we go. Um, it thought and felt could be communicated by pushing a button. It'd be like using the world's simplest app, one that just sends out a little ping, always at the same volume and length to communicate everything from it sure is cold in here to I love churros to boy I sure would like to breathe sometime soon. Well, that is actually exactly how your neurons send all the impulses responsible for every one of your actions, thoughts, and emotions. When a neuron is stimulated enough, it fires an electrical impulse that zips down its axon to its neighboring neurons. But they've only got one. So, if, you, if they found this content, you probably wouldn't be too horrified. This is called Crash Course. Um, uh, this is not bad, right? It is 11 minutes. It's not an hour and 11 minutes, right? It's a nice short. He looks very young. He talks way too fast. But he does have wood paneling. <laughs> but it's also, it's got high production value. It's animated, right? I mean, this is actually not bad content. So you're, you're probably not too upset. Um, and, and in fact, if they went to this, or they went to some of the other places. So in fact, the place they've most likely gone to is the Khan Academy. This is the number one educational site on the planet. So most of your students will have used this in high, this is how they got through high school, right? And these are, these are also short, and he has a different style, right? He doesn't, he's not on screen, but he... You know. And if you remember from the last video, these are kind of where, you know, air goes in through our trachea, then that splits up into our bronchi, and then those split into the bronchioles. Fine, ah, okay, that's great. Right, so he has a style. Um, but think about it, there's also options in other languages, right? You, know, you may be great at explaining Hegel in English, Hegel's tough in German, but if my first language is Spanish, I might actually want to have somebody explain to me in Spanish. So here's a Spanish language academic website that's full of videos, various content, you can see all the various, right? So most of us can't speak multiple languages at the same time, but the internet can. 
right? So one of the, so if you have students of various levels, various backgrounds, the internet is actually really good at being multivalent, right? At being able to say, here's a video, here's a reading, here's something that's harder, here's something that's easier, right? You can have lots of different types of ways to material. So the good news is, um, your, your, your students may land on some, on some good stuff, but the, the problem is that students are gonna do something. They are going to um, generally do this. When you, whatever you put in your syllabus, they're gonna type in, they're gonna go, feminist theory. Oh yeah? No, feminist explain, because theory is too hard a word. <laughs> it's true. Then see this button that says all, this is the button that you use, right? How to explain, right? Yeah, that's not what they're gonna do. They're gonna click on this button here that says videos. <laughs> videos. And then see this? They're gonna do this, and they're gonna say, see that, see what I did, search tools? See this, any duration? That's what they're gonna do. They're gonna look for short videos. So, so you could say, hey look, I've assigned a 10 page reading, it will take you 20 minutes, and students will spend an hour looking for a three minute video. <laughs> I didn't make these rules up. But that is in fact what students will do. So what you wanna do is you wanna actually know what the first hit is. And this in fact is the first hit. You should Hi, know. I'm a feminist. Oh no, why? I want to get equal rights for women. You must be pleased with your success. No. Why not? The patriarchy. The patriarchy? It means men control everything, and we need feminists to fight more than ever. How can that be, when women are the majority of voters in every election? A lot of women voters are worthless. Okay. So the first point, this is, a, this is a, an animation from a site called Extra Normal. So if you want to make one of these, you just type in the, the text and it, it does all this for you. It's actually a pretty easy thing to do. You can do this yourself for your students. But the second point I want to make is that you and I are laughing at this because we recognize satire. But the students who are watching this have no idea this is satire, right? They think this is real. And so in fact, students are going to walk into your class and go, hey, in fact, they're going to feel very good. They're going to go, hey, you know, mom, I didn't have to buy the reading. In fact, I skipped that reading because I found a great three-minute video that explained feminism to me. Right? They're going to feel really good about this, and you're probably not going to know. So my point is, in fact, what I want them to do is to say, you know what? Everybody should watch this, this video. Then take out an index card and find three mistakes. Um, tell me what the bias is. Why might this not be the most truthful rendition of feminist theory? Right? Bring it to class, hand it to your neighbor, turn it over, write a rebuttal, have some, the first thing in every one of my classes is some kind of interaction about what did you watch, what did you watch, was it a good source? Because I'm gonna argue that the most important skill that your students need is the ability to be skeptical about what they see on the internet. Because the truth is, you can't actually teach them what they need to know for a job in the next century. 25 years from now, you don't have any idea what the jobs are gonna be. We don't have any idea, right? The recent studies have the two most jobs most likely to be roboticized from majors in finance and accounting. Oops, sorry. Remember petroleum engineering? That was a great major a couple of years ago. All those petroleum engineers, 100,000 of them got laid off in Texas the last six months. They're all looking for work. Probably not as petroleum engineers. So yes, we teach content, we profess, that's all good. But the ability to keep learning, to learn new things is really critical. And a lot of that learning will happen on the internet. Because the information that you need for a job of the future hasn't yet been discovered. So there's no shame in saying, I can't teach you that. I can't teach you how to think. I can't teach you the subject as we currently know it. And it will change. And in fact, that bit, it will change, is actually really useful for students. When you tell students, this is what we used to think, this is what we think now, I don't know what we'll think in the future, it brings them into the community of scholars and says, you have agency. You could be the one that says, you know that way that we think about this now? Nah, there's a better way. It's a different way, right? That, and if you tell students, this is it, write it down, right? You're, you're, you're sending a message that knowledge is static and fixed, and we all know that it's not. So I actually think we should abandon textbooks and let students dive into the messy world of the internet, but help them critique everything they find, and be skeptical, and learn to think about all of this sort of stuff. Because they might be finding good videos, they might be finding bad, but everything they find, they should think about. And of course, they might also find um, something like this. Another favorite. 
This number right here, this number right here, yes, 2,800,000 views. That's why they're not in your physics class, All right? This is a whole lot more fun. Um, so so this, is, this, is, this is an example of, of the kind of information that's out there. There's also lots of simulations, lots of games. Um, you can, there's a site from the University of Colorado that's um, thousands of interactive uh, simulations. Um, I also, here's, here's one of my um, games, and I literally do this as a video game for my students. So I say, look, first day of class, um, there are a couple of games in my course. You download them, they're each worth 10% of your grade. Um, each level is worth 10 points. So if you want to get an A on this assignment, you have to get to level 9. If you get to level 10, then don't bug me about extra credit, just go to play an extra level or two, right? So there are a couple of these things. Um, this is one of them. Um, and so you see it has instructions. Notice it doesn't tell you too much because it doesn't, right? They, you'll, you're going to move your cursor because you're 18 and that's how things work. Um, so you click on drones and what happens? You get drummers. Surprise. Um, and so there's one that plays. And I can uh, add some, right? I'm putting together a band here. So, uh, and this band never existed, but it doesn't matter because I can change the drummer pretty easily. Dizzy Gillespie. Right, so, I can check this. So my point is, now this is again, so this is, the, the, they play this, so it gets progressively harder all semester. The point is it's literally a game, and the students have control, and they can play as much as they want. Um, if you want to borrow one of these, you go to something called merlot.org. You type in your subject, and somebody else who's probably done this, in this case me, for jazz history, just borrow the game. There it is, you can use it. Um, there is also smashfacts.com. It's really just a basically a multiple choice. Tiny Tap is one. Kahoot is the big one now that's taken over K through 12. But Kahoot is another way, just a like, way to have these little quizzes. Students can play them in the car when they're waiting, because as you know, nobody waits anymore. Um, so, all right, so there's, so there's video games too. That's another fun thing um, that we could do. Um, let's see what else I have. Um, one other one I want to point to is edX. Um, if you're not aware of edX, this is the Harvard-MIT $85 million collaboration to put us all out of business. So this is free content from Harvard and MIT. Um, let's look at some of the things we can do here. If you look at, let's see if I can uh, do that. So look at the types of courses that are offered. Um, there's project management, there's computer science, aerodynamics. Um, ooh, there's courses in other languages, might be interesting. There's history courses, right? There's really a pretty dog behavior for free, right? So there is, there is lots of great content and there's certainly lots and lots of, of cat videos and other stuff. On the other hand, you might want to make your own content. And my suggestion here is if you make your own content, think about the value of a podcast as opposed to lecture capture. Because lecture capture is just, you know, this, it's like a film of a theater play, nobody really cares. Remember I said that good teachers teach to the middle? Well, what you want to do is customize to every single student. 
So I teach a course on jazz history. I used to teach this thing on the blues. I would do this live for students and say, hey, okay, here's, here's me teaching you how to do a 12 bar blues. Here is a chorus of Count Basie's one o'clock jump. You'll notice there is something musical to mark every new chorus and that something different happens every chorus. Notice you can do this in the toilet. I'll count it for you. On your phone. Two. Three. Why do you do this in class? Four. It's the 12 bar blues. Five. Six. Seven. Eight, Wait for 12. nine, ten, eleven, twelve. New chorus. One, right. two. Then what would I do? Three. Well, I'd look around the room and I'd see who's with me. Five. And if I got some head nodding, I'd say, "Okay, let's move on." And I got like, mm, I do some more, right? That's a, that's called teaching in the middle. We all do it. It's what good teaching is. But I realized that. And I was like, oh, I have three more examples, but I ran out of time. I have 12 more examples, right? You never run out of time on a podcast. But mostly, I could give control over which examples to each individual student. So I said, well, maybe, maybe you're not getting it because you didn't play the band in, in high school, or maybe you're not getting it because you just hate that type of music, and what you really need is a different example. So where else in American pop music do you think we'll find the blues? I'm going to do the same thing. Well, how about bluegrass? I've changed the analogy, changed the example. Two. It's still a 12 bar blue. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. New chorus, one. Right? So some of you are going, okay, that I could learn because I could listen to that all day. And those of you who are going, what ring of hell are we in now? <laughs> so I say, okay, I can teach you the 12 bar blues that way, or I can teach you with this. Here's James Brown signals. It's the same concept. Same phrase. So the point is, all of us speak in analogies. All of us teach by comparing stuff we know to what our students know. But if I'm using soccer analogies, this part of them is happy, but the baseball people are going, I want baseball. I say, okay, I'm going to switch to baseball. And the soccer people are but I like the soccer analogies. Oh, but I, okay, you eat cooking analogies, gardening analogies, right? Facebook, I mean, right? So most of us can't do all of this at once. Right? So we use one or two, and then we switch back and forth. In a podcast, you could do these. You could do this with a PowerPoint. Right? Just take your one concept, copy it 20 times, and then label them by the type of analogy, not the concept. So I'm going to teach you about this algorithm using baseball analogies, using shoe analogies, and then you have lots of different types of examples. And students can pick which one that will appeal to them. It gives them rights customized. But you may also say, well, I don't. I don't have that much. I don't know what language the students speak. So there's another way to do this, which is to actually outsource this to the students and say, I would like you to explain to your roommate in two minutes this concept. This works for any subject. So math, where we tend to assign problem sets, here's a math professor at Goucher. So this is a current Goucher student. And the assignment was, explain to your roommate how functions work in a two minute video. All right, so there's problem sets too. The problem sets don't get out. Do you really understand how this mathematical principle works? You didn't want to teach students how to make a video. You say, everybody do this assignment. Here's an example. Hey, I'm Joe Fraction, and this is the Joe Fraction Show. On this episode, we'll be covering functions. A function is a special relationship between two values where each input has exactly one output. A good application of functions is looking at the relationship between level of skill with an instrument and the level of chicks that you can get. See, as his skill level is one, he gets one chip. Hey, Billy, how's that bass playing going? I'm having a little trouble here, Joe. Oh, I'm not quite getting it. Oh, not to fear. With the bass function, there's a wide intercept, so with zero skill level, you get two bays. Functions. The guitar function here has a higher slope, so with a little amount of skill, you get a lot of girls. Pretty simple, huh? So the point is that next year, I, don't, I can use this as an example. I can take two or three of these and say, oh, so here are two or three different ways to understand functions. If you don't want that one, here's one about gardening, here's one, right? So you can build a library um, of these things. Great. Um, okay. So, lots of ways to get students first exposure. Um, and 
So now I want to talk a little bit about social proximity. So how can I use social proximity to interact with my students outside of class so I can make more time in class for the stuff that really matters? So my first suggestion is that you stop making announcements in class. You set up an email, Twitter, web page, whatever, and I you're thinking, they don't check their email. Right, that's because you don't require them to. So here's the way you do that. Never pass out a syllabus. Hi, welcome to my class. I'll send you the syllabus by email in an hour. Then you have to check, or whatever, or whatever method you want them to do all semester long, I'll post it on the website, I'll put it on the Facebook, whatever, you know, the, the Canvas, Blackboard, whatever you use, right? That's what you're gonna do, Blackboard here, right? Yeah, okay, I'm gonna post it on Blackboard in an hour. It's not there now, because otherwise I'll get on their phone and they'll try to figure out how many pages they're reading this for me, right? So you don't want them to do that. You want the first day of class to get excitement about why this course is gonna change your life, why it matters. So get them used to that, and you can save that three minutes a day from making announcements, because the truth is you want it, you want it in a hard copy anyway. We know that students learn more when they believe that you care about their learning. Notice I didn't say you had to actually care. <laughs> the research tells us that in fact if they believe this perception, they learn more. So they perceive that when you text them encouraging messages that you care more. It's not that hard. And you think about it, your, 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 your sense of, hey, this is something is happening, uh, you should do the reading. Um, that's, they don't need that in the syllabus. They need it on Saturday afternoon or Sunday night before the Monday morning quiz, right? So little reminders. Um, hey, I know chapter one in Foucault is hard. Just keep going. It gets better. Just kidding. But, <laughs> but they'll appreciate your, your show of passion for them. Notice that we make connections rather well, and students don't. But that's probably because we pretend that our classrooms are like Las Vegas. You know, what happens here stays here. You want students to make connections, so Twitter is the perfect tool for this. So try once a week or once a day even. Tweet something with the course hashtag, right? Find an eight-year-old to explain what a hashtag is, um, if you don't know that. But um, tweet something once a day that relates to my course, right? It could be in the New York Times, it could be a Seinfeld clip, it could be a cat video. But tweet something about how it relates. So now they're having to think every day, find something that relates to my course, find something. Right? That's not a bad thing, they're making connections all the time. Remember, too, that you're weird. I'm sorry. You like school so much, you're still here. <laughs> That's not normal. They want to graduate, they want to leave, right? So you understood why we were being asked to read these crazy French philosophers and all that stuff. You did all the reading, probably. You're still here, you're weird, right? So students don't have that as a, it's not a normal thing. Why do I need to read? Is there a shortcut? Could I find a three minute video instead, right? If you want them to do the reading, you've got to explain to them why is the reading bit important and maybe give them a little bit of motivation. And the point that you want to do that is not in the syllabus or in the last class. Next Tuesday, don't forget, reading is really cool. But Monday night, when they say, do that reading, it really is cool, I'm not kidding. Right, here's a, maybe a little bit of a way to get into that reading and send them a little short, both encouraging motivational message, but something that actually has the point to, to give them a little study question. Um, is when you actually think they might be doing it. All right. Also, you can use online to build community, right? If you answer email too much, here's a solution. When students send you emails, say that's a great question, post it on the Facebook group or on whatever you know, web chat you've got so everybody can see it at once. Facebook's actually a great place for this, right? Because if you answer their email, then somebody else will send you the same question. So what I want you to do is to say, find a Facebook group. Students can send me chat, I do triage of chat. So hey, my dog get my homework. Okay, you need to come in and see me as the third homework eaten this week. <laughs> or you know, that's a great question. Post it on Facebook and everybody else will get to see my answer to your question. But it also means that at three in the morning when I've gone to sleep, the students are still answering each other's questions. They've actually built community. Again, first generation students, this is a useful thing to have other people they can ask, otherwise they're sitting at home with mom and dad who may not know the answer, and the kids whose parents are professors have an advantage. So you want to get them out into this communal space, and the, the internet is a great way to do that. But my favorite use of the internet and social media is to demonstrate what it means to be a slow thinker. Right, because all of you are good at this, and our students have probably never seen this. So when the student asks you a question, you might say, no, that's a great question. And even if you know the answer, try this. I'm gonna think about that 
I have to think about that some more. I have to do a little research. I'll send everybody an email later. Even if you know the answer. Because what you're doing is you're modeling that what makes you smart, because they think you're smart, because you are. But if you answer right away, oh, he's smart because he knew the answer. Therefore, I must know more answers that will make me smart. Well, that's partly true. But what really makes you smart is the ability to think, to ponder, to evaluate, and then gather more information. So you can use Twitter or your Facebook or your other kind of feed to say, I'm going to get back to you later. I need to think about it, to demonstrate that and to model for them what it means to be a real thinker. And then finally, of course, all this leads the way to virtual office hours. Not that you should give up having regular office hours, but being online for an hour from 9 to 10, if you can stay up that late, from 10 to 11. That's when they're on Facebook. That's when they're actually studying. That's when they need answers to your questions. This might mean rethinking faculty workload. It might mean we need to have somebody on call. Right? Doctors figure this out. Right? I don't want to be in a small practice and I'm on call all the time. But the chemistry department could share those duties. Maybe you have a couple of graduate students. But having somebody on call to answer questions on Facebook is going to give students the information when they need it. You can see that this is a shift. This is data is a couple of years old now, but the smartphone is becoming right. They are on their devices um, more and more of the time. Okay, I did talk about games. I talked about um, there's the names of a couple of websites. So, I, so then the question is, well, wait, 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 how how do I make sure they actually watch the video? So there are a couple things I would do. But one is I give an exam before every class. Three, four, ten questions at most. A couple of minutes. You use Blackboard. It works very well. These are called multi-answer questions. They're easy to grade. You can give them for hundreds of students at once. I make them do an hour before class. So an hour before class, I can go in and see what the answers were. So remember that trick about the syllabus? I'm not going to give you a syllabus. I'm going to post it. And by the way, the email I send in an hour, it has the link to the syllabus quiz. And it's due an hour before the next class, and there'll be a quiz before every class. Short, five minutes, it's going to help you make sure that you actually understand what's going on. So what's the answer here to my syllabus quiz question? No, fall in love is actually a course learning outcome. <laughs> because look, uh, this is not structural engineering. The bridge is not going to fall down if you fail my course. But you will have a better life if you fall into something you can fall in love with. If you learn to love Duke Ellington or Thelonious Monk, your life is going to be richer. But it's also true that that process of change requires saying, you know, I didn't think I liked sushi. Now I like sushi. <gasps> I changed. Right? Recognizing that change is possible is an important step for students, if that is what the process is. So the answer is actually um, four. If you read the syllabus, you take the quiz, it takes you five minutes. Now I get you to read the syllabus outside of class, you take the quiz online. All right? So we know a lot about the science of learning. I've talked about these things today. I'm just going to give you a quick couple of highlights. This is a great book if you want to actually know the summary of the last 20 years of this. Um, you learn what matters to you. No surprise. Knowledge is necessary. Not a surprise. But self-testing, retrieval, actually turns out to be really important for learning. So lots of retrieval. The problem with midterms and finals is they're high stakes. The retrieval bit is actually good, hence a test before every class. Elaboration, I talked about that, analogies, abstracting information, highlighting turns out to be very bad, right, because it creates false fluency. It looks familiar, I just highlighted it. Yeah, the more you highlight, the less you know, right? You've highlighted the whole book, yeah, that's not good, right? <laughs> Much better to close the book, call your mother, explain it to your mother in language she understands. Failure is important for learning and is very practice in spacing things out. So I've tried to put this into a cycle to think about how do I design this space? So the first thing is to think about entry point, right? If what matters to me is what I learn, then it's not about how much I know. It's, oh, you're a professor, you know lots of stuff. That's fine. So let's imagine the situation. You're an expert. You have three PhDs in racial profiling. Four, take four. I want you to do an eight-hour class for the police force on Saturday. Are your four PhDs going to help you? Are they excited about your course on racial profiling? So you've got to think about how do I start? How do I get them motivated to not tune out the minute I walk in the door? So where do you start? Do you start with race and profiling? Probably not. You need to find something that matters to them. Right? So in my Wagner course, I don't start with Gesamtkunstwerk. I start with who likes music and lyrics? 
song you like, right? So if you're talking to the police, maybe you start with, who likes Ford trucks? Who likes Chevy? Are they the same people? Why do you like Ford? You don't like Ford? Why not? Your daddy liked Ford. Oh, really? Is that a bias? Right? I mean, I, I need, I'm looking for some way to, right? that's the entry point. That's the teaching thing. It's not about how much I know. It's about how I figure out what's in your head, right? Um, I often say we're, the teaching, you know, it's, again, it's, we're all confused about what a smartphone means, right? Because a phone isn't smart. Because more is not smarter. Same is true for exercise equipment. Right, if I put more exercise equipment in your house, would it help? An exercise bike in every room? Two in the bathroom, three in the kitchen, am I helping? Right, but there's a job for somebody called a fitness coach. What does that person do other than stand there in a speedo and go, get on the bike? Right, because a fitness coach actually does more. A fitness coach knows something about anatomy, nutrition, about your body, about the equipment. Right, a fitness coach takes measurements, see how far you've progressed, how you're doing. Let's work on the arms today, work on the legs last time. But mostly, a fitness coach knows about you and what motivates you. That's the critical piece, right? You want to wear that dress to the prom, I understand, yeah? Okay, okay. pedal faster. <laughs> That's non-trivial. That is actually where the teaching bit comes in. So entry point, we hardly ever talk about it. It's really important. Content, I talked about a lot. Exams before every class. Um, so I also make you write. I, will, I use index cards, very low tech, bring them to class. I do that a lot because I want you to be writing all the time and being critical of the sources. Um, and then class can be the place where the failure and the other stuff happens. Right? I can complicate things in class. Um, and then I use these things, cognitive wrappers, they're on my website, teachingnaked.com, if you want to see a template for that. But it's a reflective exercise to get you to think about how you can improve your own learning. And then I talked a lot about e-communication today. So that's the cycle. Um, that's actually the, the subject of the next book, which is out in a couple of months. Um, so I'm going to see, do I have to run out of time for this? Uh, I talk too much, I always talk too much. Okay, so let me, just, let, me, uh, let me finish up by showing you some naked classrooms. Um, there's no naked people in them. Um, but there's a lot of glass, movable furniture. Uh, I hope you can see them better than I can. But this, this I call the, the, uh, the e-nook. It's on the side and the front. My, my faculty call this the, the diaper changing station. Um, but the chairs move around. Um, you can write on the walls. Put these things on your thing. Notice the chairs all move, they're in clusters. Um, this is a chemistry 101 classroom that used to that seats 100 students. Notice there's no front, it's just whiteboards, groups of four computer students are actively doing stuff all the time. And of course, um, retention in chemistry doubled um, when this happened. So new technology is a challenge, it's here. But the good news is it means that thinking has just gone up in value. Right? What we teach really is thinking. It's become a much more important skill. The bad news is that course design also became more important. Right? What you know matters less. How you design the learning environment matters more. And most of us were not trained in that. So we're going to have to think about course design in new ways. And also integration matters. How do we pull the pieces together? Right? Because the internet is fundamentally disaggregated. Right? Siri knows lots of bits of information, but thinking thoughtful people connect the dots in interesting ways. And so how do we help students do that? Because we spend lots of money to bring students together in communities. Are we really helping them connect what they learn in physics, in anthropology, in student government, in sports? All those things are costing us money. If we don't actually leverage that for more integration, then we're just going to get the cheaper internet sources will we'll end up taking over. So the real point of all this is that we need a new title, right? So professor suggests that your value is in the fact that you can profess, right? That your value is in that you know more than your students. So remember that fitness coach, right? Whose value is in knowing the students? So maybe the better title for all of us is cognitive coach. Because our real value is in designing learning environments and understanding our students. In fact, I would argue that yes, Students are going to learn stuff. Content is important. But content has become less important for us to deliver, at least in the face-to-face, in the -face, that 
that's more about relationships. Students can get content in other ways, and again, more varied ways, because the internet can do it in Spanish or in Arabic simultaneously. They can do easy, harder video games. All that can happen simultaneously on the web. We can just deliver it at one speed here. But in fact, the real value of who you are in the classroom is in fact who you are. You are an intellectual superhero to our students. You really are. You're, the, you're, the, you're an impressive person. You're a hero. Right? That's why you get to wear the cape every year. I mean, the, 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 yeah, the you know, the thing. <laughs> Your superhero cape. Right? And it does matter because our students, especially at this time in America, may have never seen an adult change his or her mind. So when a student asks you a question, you really want to blow their world, you say, you know, that's a great question. You may have changed my mind. Uh, that, right? That's, that's for a student, right? You have the power to change my mind. But you've also modeled for students what it means to be smart. A smart person is not the one who knows all the answers and spits them right back at you. A smart person is somebody who can say, that's interesting. I'm going to be thoughtful. I may have to rethink my other assumptions, and you may have changed my mind. That may be the only model that students get of what the real goal of education is, to be skeptical, to be critical, and ultimately to change your mind. And so that's really what we're in the business of doing, is trying to help students learn how that process of reflection works so they can change their mind. It's the hardest job anywhere, and you don't get paid nearly enough to do it. But it is incredibly valuable to our society as a democracy and ultimately to individuals. If you can light the spark, if you can turn that switch on where students now have passion for learning and understand that process. It turns out, by the way, passion is transferable. And if you, if you don't get it turned on by the time you're 25, 26, it's harder to turn on later because your brain hardens up. Literally. But if you can do that, you really can change the world one student at a time. It's, it's absolutely the essence of what we do, and it's hard. And so for taking the time and the energy to try to design spaces where that can happen, I thank you. Thank you very much. So the next set of um, concurrent sessions are taking place at 3.15, we're right on schedule. And I really want to encourage you after the session to come to our networking. Uh, we have a great surprise for you for hanging in all day. Thank you. See you later.